World War I, Strategical Disadvantages of Technology. Throughout World War I, various inventions were developed before and during the conflict and were used by both the Allied and the Central Powers in attempts to gain strategic advantage. While many of these various technological developments proved to be beneficial, others proved to be utterly futile. Despite various regional conflicts in Europe following the Napoleonic Wars, such as the Franco-Prussian War, Europe had averted continental-wide conflicts thanks in part to the concert of Europe. Despite this relative century of peace, imperialism, nationalism, militarism, and the alliance system resulted in yet another major conflict, a conflict unparalleled in horror as a result of the technological developments of the te Industrial Revolution. These technological developments include inventions such as the telegraph and railroad system, which resulted in advanced communication and trans transportation across Europe and the colonial empires. In addition, airplanes and airships followed, uh, that followed allowed for surveillance of our militaries. Advancements in navies caused increased tensions between major colonial empires and naval empires. The British and the German are some of the best examples of this. In addition to these adva advancements, weapons of mass destruction, such as machine guns and tanks, were produced at an unparalleled rate as a result of the factory system and the usage of interchangeable parts. Among the most important inventions used within World War I was the creation of the telegraph and railroad systems across Europe and colonial empires. These systems interconnected colonial empires to the greatest extent in history. Through these new means of communication and transportation, the colonial empires felt a greater sense of unity that could be physically felt with a greater degree of union being made a reality. Throughout World War I, troops could be moved across colonies and locations such as Africa, and particularly by the British, which also allowed for a greater degree of the empire and commonwealth having strategic planning among themselves. Telegraph's plan played not only a central role in creating unity within European states and their empires, but also created a key role in allowing commanders and chiefs, such as monarchs and other heads of states, in addition to other military leaders to communicate with their troops and commanders in battle, as various battles such as the Somme and Verdun lasted months. In addition, the telegraph allowed for increased communication between Allied nations throughout the course of the war. At the commencement of World War I, the German Empire faced multiple questions of how to fight a war with both Russia and France. Considering the alliance system and both France and Russia being members of the Triple Entente, it was conceivable that France would join the war with Russia against Germany. Thus, the Scheifelin Plan, which called for a movement of troops from the Mene Line, would be used. One of the best ways to move troops would be the use of railroad systems. The usage of railroad systems, however, had, had its challenges despite its advantages. While the usage of railroads would allow for a more easy penetration of France by German troops in the example of the Schifflin Plan, the railroad systems in Germany, Belgium, and France did not use the same gauge as a track, resulting in the same railway equipment and particularly locomotives not being able to travel between countries. On the outset of the Great War, Germany had what some historians consider to be the most advanced railway system in Europe. This massive and powerful railway system included various inventions in railroad technology that would come to be of the most importance during World War I. These railroad in innovations included various inventions such as the Zinling locomotive. The steam locomotive did not require returning facilities as it could be operated in both directions of travel, having two sets of controls in the cab. In addition to the various railroad inventions in the German Empire throughout the Central Powers, there were also interconnection being made through railroad system. This included plans to connect Ottoman oil fields to the German railway system via Austria-Hungary and the Kingdom of Bulgaria. This access would have included a major strategic advantage over the Allied powers, giving a level of unity between the Central Powers that would not be possible to the Allies. Despite these plans, the railroad was never completed and resources that could have gone more directly to the fight were wasted by the Central Powers. 
In the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, lack of development in the railroad system calls for the average train to travel at around 10 miles per hour. Thus, rather than railroads providing major advantages to the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, it caused the country to go to war at what some have regarded as the speed of a bicycle. In addition to the railroad system being used to move resources to the front lines and move soldiers into battle, the railroad system also allowed for the movement of wounded troops. The number of wounded troops in the Great War was unparalleled to previous wars, and thus the necessity of the railway system was central to the treatment and survival of injured soldiers. On the front lines, trains were often coated in armor, and during the war, railroad guns were put into use as large cannon-like railroad cars. All these methods allowed for railroads to be more like another form of transportation, ships. At the start of the Great War, a powerful navy, navy often determined the power of the country. Navies were central to the protection of not only the European powers and their colonies, but also the shipping of the country. Naval battles had often determined the victors of global conflicts. A kingdom or state without a strong navy could possibly be forced into surrender by having its food, medical supplies, or ammunition cut off by a rival navy. At the turn of the century, the British Empire was regarded as having the most powerful navy in the world. This was crucial to the unification power and might of the British Empire. This was due to a variety of reasons. Firstly, with the British dominions and colonies spread across every continent, the movement of resources and troops also made possible uh, by a strong navy uh, that could act as a troop transport and guard merchant ships with supplies for the war effort. For example, in the British Indian Empire or British Raj, large supplies of wheat were sent to the British Isles and to the Western Front to feed the British Empire's troops. Canadian crops were also shipped to Europe across the Atlantic on merchant ships. These merchant ships were often guarded with British destroyers, as the North Atlantic was plagued with German U-boats. Despite the power of the British Navy, various other powers have been attempting to build a powerful navy for decades and even centuries. The Russian Empire had been attempting to build Western ports since the time of Catherine the Great. In the Pacific, the Russian Navy suffered various defeats against the Japanese Navy in the Russo-Japanese War of 1904 to 1905. Thus, on the outset of World War I, the Russian Navy was in a struggle to regain its honor. The newly unified German Empire was tasked with building on the back of the Kingdom of Prussia's naval legacy, and was tasked with industrializing and modernizing its navy to meet the power and might of the British Empire. In the United States, President Teddy Roosevelt had recently expanded the United States Navy and had sent the Great White Fleet on a global tour. Through Roosevelt's presidency, the United States came to be seen by European powers as a co-equal and a worthy contender on the global stage, both militarily and economically. One of the most important technologies of the Great War was the submarine. Though the submarine had been used to varying degrees since the American Revolution, the first modernized and practical submarine was not in existence until 1897. Though the United States took some interest in the early development and usage of naval submarines, the British Empire took great interest in using submarines as defensive powers for the coast of the British Isles and harbors throughout the empire. Thus, on the onset of World War I in 1914, the British Empire had the largest roster of submarines in the world. In the study of World War I, the mention of submarine generally brings imagery of the German U-boat. Despite this, prior to World War I, there was little interest by the German Navy to build a submarine fleet. This all changed when Kaiser Wilhelm II took a ride in a submarine and personally commanded a German submarine fleet be constructed. Throughout World War I, the German U-boats would sink over 5,000 Allied ships. This would include notable sinking such as the British flag Lusitania, Sussex, and Arabic. Despite the great, great successes based around the number, around numbers of sinkings, German U-boats and other submarines in general were, were faced with various challenges uh, by both the Central and Allied powers alike. These challenges include obstacles such as how to deal with low visibility, 
due to which U-boats had to position themselves for an attack prior to submerging beneath the surface. U-boats were notoriously slow, particularly when above the surface of water. This made them highly susceptible to attack by allied ships. U-boats were challenged with being able to hold enough fuel to be practical for offensive operations in the middle of the ocean. Inventions such as diesel fuel aided in these measures, however, also made submarines vulnerable on the surface. In addition to the challenges faced by carrying enough fuel to be practical, U-boats and other submarines were challenged with needing to carry enough oxygen for their crews. Of the most important examples of naval importance in World War I is the Battle of Hoodland. In this battle, the superiority of the British Royal Navy was put to the test by the German Imperial Navy. The advancements of the German Navy, which included advanced armored plate and superior shells, allowed the weak armor of the British fleet to, to be breached. This called various ships, such as the HMS Invincibles magazines, to be ignited, resulting in the entire ship bursting into pieces. pieces. Through the British Empire's uh, power uh, and its speed, uh, they were able to uh, lose only 6,000 British subjects. However, uh, unparalleled to the success previous successes of the German Navy, uh, 2,000 German sailors were lost. In addition to the Battle of Hutland, the sinking of ships such as the Lusitania demonstrates the importance of U-boats and ships during World War I. The German Empire saw trade uh, and supposed weapon trade to be a passenger vessels as such a threat that it was willing to risk war with the United States over sinking British ships carrying American citizens. Therefore, it can be concluded that shipping across the Atlantic Ocean played a major impact, at least in the eyes of the German Empire, on the war effort. In addition to the importance of the modernized Navy and merchant fleet, the usage of relatively new transportation technology and warfare did not include only submarines, but also airplanes and airships. For the first time in the world's history, warfare turned towards the skies and the civilian population of the battling European states were placed in direct attack by air term military actions. When one is asked about the bombing of London, minds generally turn to the Battle of Britain in World War II. However, it was during World War I that the United Kingdom was faced with German attack by air for the first time. A large fleet of German airships and its zeppelins were tasked with bombing the city of London in addition to coastal cities. While not as successful as the Battle of Britain in World War II, the airship bombings in London were most beneficial in their psychological impact on the British population. Questions of why the United Kingdom had entered its continental war began to be posed by the general population, specifically uh, by London. Despite the subjectivity of the British Isles to German airship raids, Kaiser Wilhelm refused to allow attacks on historic or religious buildings in addition to Buckingham Palace. This was based on his respect for traditional European war honor. If nothing else, the United Kingdom's morale was lowered as a result of the German airship raids. The newly established Royal Air Force was tasked to defend London from any possible danger from airship raids. Early attack methods on airships by airplanes were used uh, in attempts to uh, ignite hydrogen bags of gas used to lift, lift the airship by shooting at them. This method was entirely futile. This resulted in the experimentation of new bullets that would ignite on impact. These bullets were known as Buckingham bullets. As the bullets were released from the barrel of machine guns, friction caused these bullets to ignite. When mixed with standard rounds, these bullets were capable of igniting the hydrogen gas bags inside German Zeppelins. The first successful downing of a German Zeppelin in London came by a British airman uh, named William Robertson, who was rewarded the Victorian Cross for his actions. He was viewed as a national hero, and Londoners became more motivated than ever to defeat the Central Powers. While the history of airships in World War I is usually focused on German raids on London, 
There were also attacks on various cities in Belgium, France, and Russia. In addition to the to tactical advantages of dropping bombs, Zeppelins allowed the German Empire advantage over its enemies by allowing surveillance. This surveillance included not only actions on land, but also those at sea. German airships provided surveillance ahead of German fleets and allowed for the first time in history Navy's preparation before coming in contact with the enemy fleet. German Zeppelins were even credited by the British as being the primary reason for the German success of the Battle of Hutland. While the German Zeppelins uh, are often the most remembered airships of World War I, the Allied powers also made the use of airships. The British experimented heavily with airships, along with French and Italians. By the end of the war, the United States Navy had also taken great interest in starting their own airship program. At the Treaty of Versailles, German airships were divided among the United States, France, United Kingdom, and Italy showcasing the value of the airships in the eyes of the Allies. German Zeppelins were also crucial to the interconnection of the German Empire. As World War I progressed, combat in Germany East Africa was key to the Central Powers war effort. With the German coast blockaded by the British Royal Navy, it became impossible to get crucial medical supplies from Europe to the German colonies in Africa by sea. Therefore, German high command formed a plan that would have a German Zeppelin traveling from the Kingdom of Bulgaria to German East Africa. This would result in the Zeppelin traveling 5,000 miles. While the voyage was not successfully completed, the airship stayed in the air for nearly 100 hours. Despite the various advantages of airships, both logistically and psychologically, disadvantages were also common. These disadvantages were a result of the airship in many ways being ahead of its time, and thus ahead of other forms of technological innovation. This included lack of development and understanding about the weather, lack of understanding of altitude sickness, and very little technological advantages in long distance communication that could be used by airships. Airships were incredibly susceptible to the weather of where they operated. In fact, thunderstorms which could ignite hydrogen or result in uncontrolled directional changes, have the potential of being just as dangerous as an enemy attack of the bucket and bullets. Understanding the impact that weather could have on airships could only be fully comprehended from understanding the construction of airships. German Zeppelins were constructed with a metal frame that did not have any dexterity. This frame surrounded a series of hydrogen bags the entire structure was covered with hull, often created by cow's skin. In high winds, the metal frame could be twisted, resulting in hydrogen bags being punctured. By the end of World War I in 1918, German Zeppelins were able to reach altitudes as high as 27,000 feet. While this was beneficial in avoiding uh, enemy attacks by aircraft, and oftentimes placed airships over clouds and therefore over the view of enemy from the ground, or at sea, it resulted in the altitude sickness of the airship crews. The sickness could not be fully understood during World War I, and was a new phenomenon to science. This was just one of many perils that World War I airship crews placed themselves in. Lack of communication during World War I resulted in airships often not being able to communicate information at a rapid speed. This resulted in much of their strategic advantage in, being, in spying being lost. In addition, usefulness in supplying troops uh, by airships were difficult, as troop movements could not be communicated to airships once they were in flight. In addition to airships, airplanes were a new innovation to World War I. They were put to use by both the Allied and the Central Powers. Uses of challenges to the airplane were often similar to that of the airship. The airplane, however, had many advantages that the airship did not. Such, the, uh, such as the ability to be able to more readily uh, be mass produced. For example, at the start of the war, France had just over 100 airplanes. By the end of the war, France had over 4,000. The most common uses of the airplane included that of spying. 
Prior to World War I, and even at the onset of World War I, spying had been done on the battlefield by using spies on horseback. Of course, with the modern weaponry of World War I, spying on horseback became obsolete, as crossing towards enemy lines was essentially a suicide mission. Therefore, airplanes were able to do what horses could no longer do, spy. This idea of using the relatively new invention of the airplane stemmed off the usage of hot air balloons and military surveillance during conflicts such as the American Civil War. One way in which spying by aircraft became extremely useful was that it could get, it could get above enemy troops where the invention of a camera allowed for images to be taken of enemy troops. These images provide exact details of encampments, supply centers, and division locations. Despite the usefulness of these photos in order to take them, planes had to be flown in an extremely steady and level manner, resulting in the aircraft being highly susceptible to attack from a newly developed anti-aircraft gun. During the early stages of the war, just as airships transitioned from being primarily used for spying purposes, Airplanes also began to be used for bombing purposes. Early airplanes could usually only take one, uh, one bomb that would be manually dropped directly out of the passenger's hand. This method was often not accurate. However, just as the airship created fear among the citizenry and enemy soldiers alike, the sound and or sight of an airplane instilled fear on the battlefield. There were various uh, advancements made throughout the war on the airplane. Throughout the conflict, the Allied and Central Powers were in a constant arms race on who could develop the most sophisticated, sophisticated and tactically beneficial aircraft. Italy held the lead in much of the early war. The United Kingdom, however, made one of the biggest advantages and advancements in airplane technology when it constructed by Handley Page Bomber. This aircraft was large enough to carry multiple bombs was able to carry enough fuel to stay in the air for several hours. Early in the war, France had used a rear propeller on their aircraft, similar to that used by Orville and Wilbur Wright. In order to make the aircraft more maneuverable, propellers began to be placed in the front of the airplane throughout the war. As the machine gun was further developed throughout World War I, attempts to install machine guns on aircrafts were made. These were very, there were various difficulties that designers and engineers were tasked with sur, sur, uh, surpassing, such as how to use a machine gun on an airplane without shooting off the propeller. Eventually, developments were made that included guns shooting in between the propellers as they spun. More important to the war effort than the physical damages or advantages of the aircraft was the morale of the aviation development and the usage K of their respective countries. This can be seen through the popularity of flying aces with the Mong Central Powers with men such as the Red Baron or Mong the Allied Powers with men such as Billy Bishop. One of the biggest obstacles uh, with using airplanes widespread was the necessity of trained pilots on how to fly the invention of the airplane. This was a common issue with all new inventions of World War I, and particularly the tank. The tank was first developed in World War I by the British in 1916 in an effort to break the stalemate that was arising on the Western Front. Trench warfare, including the challenges of no man's land, resulted in high casualty rates. But the idea of having an armored horse was believed to be the key to an Allied victory. The idea of the earliest tanks on the old set of World War I stemmed from inspiration of armored railroad locomotives on the front lines of the Western Front. If this type of armor was placed on caterpillar tracks, it would be able to carry soldiers into enemy lines and attack from the rear, the same principle of attacking an enemy trench. Despite this modern Trojan horse approach, soon weaponry was placed on early prototypes of tanks. This weaponry was used to fire on the enemy, rather than having soldiers inside attack once reaching the enemy trench. While the British were the first to successfully use tanks in battle, the lack of a rotating turret deemed the French tank to be, more, uh, to be much more effective. 
both French and British tanks uh, that were able to climb over earthen terrain, cross trenches, and tear through barbed wire. The sight of a tank on the battlefield was not only horrifying, but deadly, as many tank battles comparable to naval battles took place throughout the war. While Germany made attempts to develop a tank of their own, it became more economically efficient for them to use captured British tanks. Tanks, especially for the British Empire, were important to boost in pride and morale during the war effort. The tank demonstrated the spirit and might of the British Empire and was visible to the public throughout a series of demonstrations given in both Great Britain and France uh, by a fleet of British tanks on their way to the Battle of the Somme in 1916. Along with tanks, multiple types of poisonous gases were used to combat trench warfare. These gases included chlorine gas and uh, most notably mustard gas. Despite toxic gases being illegal according to the rules of war, the German Empire found ways to use toxic gases such as combining gases with shells that were being shot into enemy trenches. Soon every country involved in World War I began to use chemical weapons to varying extents. Over time, the gases began to be used by themselves. The effects of toxic gases were variable. Some gases could cause blindness for a few hours, some for a few days, and some indefinitely. Others caused confusion, while some caused death. Worse than the physical implication of gas, though, were the psychological effects that poisonous gases had in combat. Soldiers who expected to be killed by an oncoming bullet found themselves surrounded by colored gas, choking as the fumes ate their lungs away. In order to combat the growing issue of poisonous gases, militaries began to issue their soldiers gas masks. Despite them being effective against gases such as chlorine and phosphate, they were all in all, all, in all futile against mustard gas, which worked by causing irritation to the skin. The effects of mustard gas were most remembered as they, as they remained in the trenches where they were deployed up to months. Therefore, in time, the German Empire found using mustard gas difficult as their own troops would have a difficult time raiding a trench where it had been deployed. In all, World War I is remembered as the first modern technologically advanced war in world history. The modern landscape of warfare would not exist if it were not the technological advancements made between 1914 and 1918. At the start of the war, traditional methods of warfare and the ideals of German battle honor were in common practice. By the end of the war, effects of the Industrial Revolution on warfare had changed the trajectory of combat. The creation of modern warfare was in full effect. Within four short years, military history had been completely changed. For the first time in modern history, states such as the United Kingdom tasted of war on the home front, just as the continental states as a result of aviation technology. The freedom of the seas was put into question for the first time in history. The unification and expansion of railroad system was put into effect. In addition, the psychological impact of weaponry and technology began to play an unprecedented role of importance on both soldier and citizen alike. Casualties reached an unprecedented rate throughout all of the countries involved in World War I, was resulting in the lost generation as a result of mass killing machines. Machines that outsmarted and outmatched traditional battle tactics of generals, both allied and central alike. It would not be until World War II that modern warfare was fully developed or battle tactics were completely modernized to match the modern weaponry of the industrialized war world.